Couple things. Orientation. Uh, we have enough people to do it live. So we did get enough people to sign up to make it make sense to do orientation live again. So if you don't know, orientation is a 10 week program that we do. Uh, it used to be one teaching each week, and then you would get a devotional sent to, texted to your phone that was on video each day. We're actually doing it different this time. We're going to do two teachings once every other week, where you come in and you do two hours of, of me talking, um, Lord willing, and then you're going to still get the things every day that you, that you don't have a teaching. You'll be getting these uh, devotionals, about five minutes or so, sent to your phone to kind of keep you in what we're talking about. But it's basically the foundations of the faith, the foundations of the church, who we are, why we do baptism. You know, what, what we believe as a church, what we believe as Christ followers and, and so on. Um, we've had, I don't remember what, you know, 90, 100, 120 people go through orientation. We've had a lot of people go through it. Um, and we have uh, a good number of folks who are signed up to do it again. So we're gonna do it. Those dates will come out to you. If you've signed up, you're gonna get the dates that are gonna come out to you. But you need to sign up because we also have to get your phone on there so that we can text you those, although we may use the app, I'm not sure. But either way, we need to have you sign. So if you have not signed up for orientation and you would like to take orientation, please fill out one of those cards that you have in front of you. It might be the orange one that says engage where you can check orientation and make sure you put that you know, in the back, there's a little box that you can drop those in after the service. Baby bottles. You've seen some baby bottles out there. That is not for you guys to drink out of. Those are, there's a purpose for those. We just had recently uh, a decision come down by the Supreme Court. If you may recall, it was called the Dobbs decision and it overturned what had always been bad law uh, in Roe versus Wade. But one of the complaints that people have is that Christians have so badly wanted to get rid of abortion. They care so much about babies in the womb, but they claim that Christians don't care about them once they're born. That is abject. Those are lies from the pit of hell. I've been involved, as many, as you, uh, as many of you have, in crisis pregnancy centers and what they do, which is they provide for, they provide sonograms and they provide care and counseling during pregnancy and then they provide help to mothers and fathers. They provide classes, they provide diapers, they provide clothes, they provide strollers, they provide car seats, they provide all kinds of stuff after a child is born. And so it is important that we support these centers, which are the Christian response to life to wanting to see life. And so those baby bottles are for you to take and put your change or your $100 bills, whichever you can afford, in those baby bottles, and then we're gonna bring them to the pregnancy uh, center to help them raise money to do what they do. And they do such a good job for young women and men who are dealing with pregnancy, un, you know, a, an unplanned pregnancy um, who need assistance. So please grab one of those, they're out there on the uh, counter out there. If they're all gone, which I hope they're all gone. I'm just going to say, I hope we get all of them. If they're all gone and you still want one, you can either go grab a baby bottle or you can write a check. Okay. You can do the baby bottle thing if you want, or we can, I guess, get some more if, if you want, but we would really like you to grab those. You fill them up, you bring them back. We take them over to the pregnancy resource center to show that as believers, we care about life, not just in the womb, but out of the womb too. And so let's, let's do that. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Men's and women's groups. We talked about that a while back. Um, I still need you, if you are interested in a men's, if you're a man and you're interested in a men's ministry to support you and, and study the Bible as, as with other men who are dealing with issues that men need to deal with, then please sign up for that. If you haven't already, grab one of those engage cards and write it on there and put it in the thing. If you're a woman, and you want to be part of a group of women that get together and, have, and get to know each other and study the word and grow as women with things that women deal with that men don't. And there are some of those, regardless of what you might hear on the news. Um, they're di women and women are different. I'm just gonna tell you, if you haven't figured that out. Um, and so if you want to do that, please sign that, put it on the engage card. So we know we need to have the number of folks before we can make a decision about what it's gonna look like you know, how many folks we have and so on. So please do that and put that in the back if you haven't done that. All right. Looks like I've already got a bunch of questions. Let's, let's see how, uh, how we do. Okay. Uh, can I do orientation again if I've done it in the past? Yes, you can. As a matter of fact, quite a few people are, uh, have signed up to do it again because we did it five years ago or something. And, you know, it'll be a little different this time. I'm fatter. You know, that's a whole different, that's a whole new thing, which makes you wiser, by the way. <laughs> it's not true. 
Um, would be a good excuse for getting fat, though, if it was. Uh, so yes, you absolutely can. Next one, how do you know what your testimony is if you've not had huge hurdles to overcome? Hey, listen, great. <laughs> Praise God, if you haven't had huge hurdles to overcome. There are a good number of people who get saved very young, and they can't do the whole testimony thing where you go, I was in prison for 86 years. I, you know, <laughs> killed 800 people with heroin. You know, whatever. Like, you're, you, not everybody has that crazy testimony the Lord's brought. Some of us do. I have a testimony that the Lord brought me out of total wickedness. Some of you are like, you know, I lied to my mom a couple times, and that, that's what you feel like. What I'll tell you is this. If you're young... And you come to the Lord and you feel like you don't have that, like you didn't really come out of that big of sin. What I will tell you is, yes, you did. Yes, you did. From the youngest age that I was, as the Lord has shown me, my heart, my heart was rebellious towards him. Uh, if you've met any kids, you know that. Um, they are little sinners. And just like you're a big one, okay? Um, and, and you will understand what God has brought you through, but your testimony isn't just what you've come out of or the sin you've come out of, but what you've come into. Your testimony is what God has done in your life, not just in the grace he's shown you and saving you, but in the empowerment he's given you through the Holy Spirit to do the things that he's called you to do, to do the good works that he has set beforehand for you to walk in. And so your testimony is both of those things. And so if you haven't had a lot of hurdles, if you haven't had a lot of difficulties and your testimony is pretty smooth sailing, praise God, because those things really do hurt. And build a testimony in what you have done for the Lord, what you have been faithful in to the Lord and following the Lord. All right, next. Why did Jesus spit and mud to heal the blind? I have no idea. I have no idea. Um, it's, there are people who have opinions on that, right? Uh, but he was, he was doing that for a purpose uh, that, and I believe there are people who have opinions on that that have to do with the time and the place, with what's in mud, with the symbolism and so on. But I'm just gonna tell you, your pastor has no idea. I don't know why he did that. And I'm willing to admit that. I do not know why he did that. It's always been interesting, but I, I like the, the spit's kind of odd, right? Like I'm spitting your eye, but, but I like the, uh, the fact that it was tangible, you know, because it reminds us that God loves stuff because he made stuff and that God uses stuff, you know, and, and, that, and that stuff is important, that what he's created is good. And so that, that whenever he does something that's more tactile like that, it, it's a time to think about the fact that God has made this earth, knows how it works, when he heals, he is simply reversing a process that was natural because who's in charge of the natural world? He is. And so we have the sinful world and natural process that cause all kinds of things. And everything that he has to heal is him reversing back that natural process. Or in the case of, say, water into wine, increasing the speed of that natural process because God is the God of nature. He is the creator. And so, but as far as the mud, I don't know. All right. Um, what does the Bible say about dinosaurs? Actually, a decent amount. Uh, it, it does talk about dinosaurs. If you read the book of Job, uh, you'll find that. Uh, he's describing what could, I could not imagine being anything but a dinosaur. Uh, but the Bible is, is, doesn't mention you know, ocelots either um, or lots of different animals, a lot of donkeys and, and things like that. But uh, it does not specifically talk about dinosaurs. I believe that dinosaurs uh, probably were taken out in the flood especially based on how we find them now, uh, oftentimes completely intact uh, in, in one spot as if it was a, you know, as if something happened all at once. Uh, and so, yes, I believe that that's where dinosaurs are. It does, it does appear that in Job, uh, which is pre-flood, that God talks about the Leviathan. He talks about it, what at least one kind of dinosaur that we know. Uh, and so if you want to go read that, it's pretty interesting. It sounds like a pretty big dinosaur is the one that's described in Job. So that's what the Bible says about dinosaurs. I believe they existed pre-flood. I believe that they did not come. I don't think Noah wanted them on the ark for some reason. I don't know. It was. Uh, Tyrannosaurus Rex. You know, God, how about I don't do that one, you know? Okay. Let me, uh, if you're in Christ, can you still go to heaven if you struggle with sin? I'm sorry, no. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, of course, of course you can. In fact. We know that all of us will and do struggle with sin. You live in a sinful world, okay? You still are walking around with this thing, this flesh. 
And because you're walking around in the flesh and the flesh has been, is part of this broken world, there, you are going to struggle, be tempted by sin, all the rest of it. The good news is that when you became new in Christ, you got the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does not, your spirit has been renewed. Your spirit cannot sin. It's connected to the Holy Spirit. And so what you have is you have this sort of, and Paul talks about it, right? You have this sort of two sides of you that are sort of fighting each other. The flesh, which is broken by, by sin, and the spirit, which has been completely renewed if you're in Christ. And so the question is, which one are you going to sow to? Which one are you going to feed? If you got two dogs and you're, they're going to fight, which one's going to win? Probably the one you feed more, right? That's actually my, one of my dogs is way fatter than the other one. The other one would probably win because he's so skinny. But I still feed him. But if you starve dog and you feed a dog, the fed dog's going to win. So if you live to the spirit and not to the flesh... The spirit is going to win. This is why you have verses in the, in the scripture like, don't be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the spirit. Because when you're, when you're drinking too much wine, you're getting drunk, that's the body. That's, go, that's your body. Your body is now basically controlling as opposed to being filled with the spirit and letting the spirit control and lead your life. And so you will struggle with sin. In fact, the, the sad fact is, is that Jesus has a parable about the sower, right? And the sower comes and he, and he throws seed. He's throwing seed. Some of it lands on the hard ground, on the path. And the birds come and they take it away. Never, it never sprouts, no new life. But then some lands over here and it sprouts up. And it sprouts up and it sprouts up fast. But there's no depth of soil and the sun comes out and it withers. Okay, it's not fruitful. For so somebody throws over here and it sprouts up, but then sort of the thorns sort of choke it out so that it's not fruitful. And then some goes on the good ground and then you have different levels of fruitfulness, right? Some 10, some 30, some 100, and so on. I believe that, that we're talking about Christ followers here. All of the ones that sprouted because you have new life. So you have new life. So there are some Christians who literally will have nothing to show. They will have no fruitfulness to show for their life in Christ. So the question, can they struggle with sin and still be saved? Yes, they're saved. They're going to heaven. First Corinthians, I believe it's chapter three, talks about that there will be some who are saved as through fire. In other words, when we go before the Lord to receive rewards, as it says, that's what's going to happen. We're going to go before him to receive rewards. And when we do that, you're going to have all the wood, hay, and stubble in your life, the things that weren't fruitful, they're going to burn up. But the gold, the silver, the precious stones, those are going to remain. That is going to be your reward, right, that we'll offer back to the Lord. Because the Lord will do that. For some people, he says, they'll have nothing. They won't have a single little, you know, no, not even costume jewelry. They got nothing. So they're going in, it says, as through fire. They're barely made. There will be loss. There will be, there will be weeping for that person. Now, God will take care of that, and he will wipe away all tears. But there are those who will be saved who will go to heaven, but will have nothing to show for it. They'll have not been faithful. Then there will be those that have been a little bit faithful, but the world and the cares of the world have choked them out. Okay, and then there will be those who are fruitful. And I think that there's probably some aspect of all of our lives that has mirrored some of this. Maybe you've had a time where you were, where you were withering completely. Maybe you've had a time where you felt like the world was choking you out. Maybe you've had a time where you felt fruitful. We want to be in that third category, fruitful, fruitful. Um, and the more that you can be fruitful, the less that you're going to sin. Bottom line is, you are not a slave to sin if you're in Christ. Think about that. You are not a slave to sin. You sin when you sow to the body instead of to the spirit. Period. That's how it works. If you will live in the spirit all the time, you can live and not be sinning all the time. Now, the problem is, is that we do have these bodies, and they tend to really mess with us. And so my recommendation is that you grow in holiness, that you grow in sanctification by more and more waking up in the morning and starting by living in the spirit, by continuing to pull yourself back to living in the spirit throughout the day. What does the Lord want? He's the Lord of your life. He's in charge. What do you want, Lord? What do you want, Lord? What do you want, Lord? And you'll live with less and less sin. But as far as whether you're saved, no. And we're going to get into this in Romans 9, Lord willing, about what does it mean to be saved and is it something that you can lose? Okay, there are some Christians who would tell you that that's something that can be lost. Uh, we're going to talk about the different uh, positions on that. That is not my position. That is not my position. If you are in his hand, you're not, get, you're not being removed from his hand. But that doesn't mean you live however you want. That would suggest that you don't love him when he's done so much for you. So no, you're not going to, those of you who are worried about that, um, do, not, do not struggle with sin if you can help it. But no, you do not lose your salvation. All right. 
if a Christian were to lose their battle slash life to their depression or any other mental illness, do they really go to hell or is there an understanding for them? Uh, this would go to the same question I just answered, which is to say that suicide is a sin, right? It's not, it's not a loss of salvation. If you're, you know, the Catholics talk about it as basically an unforgivable sin, you know, or an irredeemable sin, and you're going to hell. I, I do not believe that. I think that's nonsense, especially when you're talking about mental illness. People with mental illness generally don't know what they're doing or are unable to make good decisions. Obviously, who knows you the best? God does. God does. So if you struggle with that, now, now I think it's absolutely sinful to commit suicide. If you are in your right mind and you commit suicide, you're, you, what you're saying is not just that you don't like living. What you're saying is that you don't like any of us. None of us are good enough. None of God's creation is good enough. Nothing that God has given you is good enough to keep living for. That's a pretty selfish thing to do. Now, having said that, I've known people who have committed suicide, um, believers, at least a couple believers that I know, who I do believe are saved, who I do believe they're in heaven. Uh, in one case, it was, I think, a pretty severe mental illness. In another case, it was a person who had a very severe case of lupus um, and just uh, was cavalier with their, with their life and lost their life. Um, I do not believe that, that that sin sends you to hell. No, I do not. I do believe it's a very grave sin. It's murder. It's a very grave sin. But I do not believe that if you've lost somebody by that, I do not believe, if they were, if they were a, a, they're saved, I do not believe that that has anything to do with their salvation. Now, it's going to go to rewards and the rewards that they could have had that they've lost, but it's not, to, it's not a salvation issue. You know, Jesus' death on the cross covered sin. It covered sin, period. If you're in him, he, your sin has been covered. So, no, you do not, you do not go to hell. Um, in the word it states, to do all things in worship and joy. When it comes to trials and tribulations, is it normal to get mad at the Lord for the feelings of being overwhelmed and unable to go through these tri trials? Um, well, the Psalms would suggest that people get mad at the Lord or frustrated with the Lord don't understand why they're going through what they're going through. In fact, the Psalms are replete with this. So if you go through and you read the Psalms, you see the saints saying, why, Lord? How long, Lord, will this continue to go on? Will this go on forever? So it's not that you can't have a feeling that feels that way when you're struggling going through trials. The question is, how do those Psalms end? But I will trust you, Lord, for you are faithful. Generally, that's, the, that's when you see these Psalms of lament, you generally see them end with the, with the psalmist saying, but I trust you. I know that this is just something, like, I needed to get that out, <laughs> but I know that I can trust you. I know that you will be faithful. Because what you're experiencing isn't new. It isn't new. The people who have loved the Lord have always been at odds with a sinful world. And the sinful world has always persecuted those who love the Lord in different ways. Okay, David has Saul chasing him all over the place. He's faithful to the Lord. And yet, this guy's after his life. You think he might have been frustrated? Like, God, I'm doing all the things. I love you. He's a man after God's own heart. And, and his life is trying to be taken by Saul. It's rough. So, in, in the Psalms, you might hear him say something like, Lord, how long do I have to hide in a cave while he eats all the good food in a castle? Right? He might have been thinking that kind of thing. And you might think that kind of thing from time to time. And it's okay to ask the Lord, so long as you're willing to accept the answer Trust me, child, because that's what he's going to say. That's what he's had to say to me. And if you're a Christ follower and you've been in the Lord long, that's what he's going to say to you. There are going to come those times where what he has to say is, trust me, child. And you've got to say, I do. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord. You've got to be in that space. But as far as getting frustrated, fr frustrated, yeah, I think you can be frustrated. Mad? I don't know. You know, the wrath of man does not bring the righteousness of God. And so getting mad or wrathful of God, I think would be a little presumptuous. He's God after all, and you're not going to win that fight. Um, and so I don't know that mad would be the right term, but sad, frustrated, I, those are feelings that are going to come. The question of, uh, about living in joy and worship is, where do you come from that? Even the psalmists are using it to worship him by saying, how long will this go on, but I trust you, Lord, which I think is a very fair thing for a Christ follower to feel and to think. Lord, this is really, really difficult. I don't understand why I'm having to go through this. I feel like I'm being faithful, but I will trust you. I will trust you. 
That's where you got to live, especially these days. If you can't live in trust in the Lord, you're going to have a rough time. I would also recommend not looking at the news too much because that makes, that makes things rough. Uh, one of these says, what is a testimony? Uh, traditionally, people have used the word testimony to refer to sort of their story of coming to the Lord, their story of who they are in Christ. So it's kind of an old evangelical term that we would have used more in decades past where it's like, what's your testimony, brother? And people would have a testimony service and they'd come up and give a testimony. It was just basically their story of of what it is. Paul had a testimony. You see it several times in there. Uh, He talks about the road to Damascus and what happened and the Lord and the blinding light and, and getting saved. He actually gives his testimony multiple times in the scripture. And so a testimony is just testifying to about what's happened in Christ for in your life. That's what a testimony is. Um, my understanding is Catholics have an additional seven books in the Bible that drive some of their beliefs, such as purgatory. Were these removed from the Bible or added by Catholics? If removed, were they true at one time? If they were true at one time, they'd be true at all times. Um, and it depends on what you mean by true. They are not scripture. Um, you know, the Pope and I haven't talked recently, <laughs> but when we do, I'm going to let them know. Um, so the books you're referring to are called the Apocrypha. They're intertestamental books. So they are, so they're 400 years between the end of the Old Testament and the arrival of Christ. Okay. During that time, things were still happening and there are books written about that time period. Uh, they were not part of the canon, the canon being the books that, that we believe to be inspired by the Holy Spirit scripture. They were not. In fact, the Catholic church uh, brought those books in and sort of put them in the canon or started recognizing them in that way, actually really after the Reformation. The Reformation being when Protestants broke off because the Catholic church was doing crazy stuff. And they were like, nope. You know, one, of, one of the things which they were doing was they were not teaching the people to really, all the masses were in Latin. People didn't understand. They didn't know how to read the Bible for themselves. Uh, they were teaching a very works-based salvation, which is unbiblical. And so Martin Luther and others separated from the church. And so the Apocrypha, uh, if you want to read it, go ahead. But it's not scripture. You know, it's not scripture. The question about its uh, validity or its importance, does it, does it reflect some historical things that are true? Yeah, it sure does. Um, but it's not scripture. The Catholics have, have brought that in. That's their call. Uh, I disagree with them, obviously, or I would be wearing a little priest thing right now, and I'm not. Although I did make you stand up and sit down a lot today. <laughs> All right. Why don't we have a testimony once in a while? Huh, I don't know. We're thinking about. Good question. Uh, what do you, would you say to people who claim that Jesus and the early church were the first communists? Uh, I would say that's got to be the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Um, If you're talking about living communally, sure, but communism is a political philosophy. There is, here's the thing that you need to understand. There is nothing, there is no political agenda in the early church. There's no political agenda. They are not trying to take over Rome. They're not trying to do that. They're not trying to create a political agenda. So communists, generally speaking, are people who prefer communism as a socioeconomic and state system. It hasn't worked great so far, but it seems like some people are really holding on, like it, like it might work. Um, not, not great. Uh, and the early Christians, you're referring to Acts, and I'll read it. It's Acts chapter 2. We can go there. By the way, there are Bibles in front of you. If you would like to take one of those home with you, um, please feel free. It's our gift to you. We want you to have a, the Word of God in your home. So let's go to Acts chapter 2. There it is. If you want to use one of those Bibles, it is on page 1020, 1021. Uh, All right. So it says, I'm going to start in verse 40, a vital church grows. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. That's a good worship service. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved." Okay, so what we have here is people, Christians, who come to know Jesus, and out of that 
out of the excitement, out of the newness of life, because there were, you got to understand, we think about the world like we think about how we live, right? You live in the most prosperous, crazy prosperous place that has ever existed in the history of the world. You have no, I, I know some of you have been to Portland and you're like, I don't know about that. That's, uh, forget that, okay? Until a couple years ago, you live in the most crazy prosperous place ever. That is not what the first century was like. It was not what the first century was like. So obviously some of these people were very poor who were in the church. Some of these people had a lot of money who were in the church. And what they chose to do, it says nothing about being compelled to do so. What they chose to do was to give generously to the people who, who in the church, to the, their fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. That's what they chose to do. This was not communism, which is a state-run system where they make you do things, right? They take your money, and then they give it to this person over there, and that's the way they do it. And I'm not even making a comment about that. We can have a, we can have a sermon on communism sometime if you want, and what the Bible says about it, but I don't care about the political. My point is, they didn't have a political system. They were not looking to make the state do anything. And they certainly weren't making the state take people's money and give it to somebody else. They chose to do that out of the goodness of their hearts. Do I believe that a Christ follower, as to his or her brothers and sisters in the church, should take care of his brothers and sisters? Yes. Of course. That's why we're doing the baby bottles. That's why we give. That's why we serve each other. Now, in this particular country, people don't have needs in the sense that these people had needs, okay? Very few of you will go a week without eating this, this week, right? Most of us, we have, you know, and we have government programs and things like that. Very few people are in the kind of poverty that people would have been in then. If we did have people in that situation, yeah, I think we would be doing that. I think those of us who, who had would be having less so that those who had nothing could have something. And that's what the church did. That's what the church did. No, they were not communists. All right. How could people in the Old Testament know that Jesus was coming when the New Testament wasn't made? Because the Old Testament was made. So, and I, you guys could go back. I think there's a Palm Sunday service from like 2017 or 18. You have to go check on the app. But I walk through the Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah where you can actually work the number of days so that they should have been aware of the day that Jesus came into Jerusalem on, on the donkey. The very day was predicted. If they had been paying attention, they would have known that this Messiah was entering Jerusalem on that day. You can actually just go back, read the prophecy, do the math, and it works out. The Old Testament is replete with prophecies about the Messiah. They should have known he was coming. And he was clear with them that they should have known he was coming. If they had paid attention, if they read the scriptures with the right heart, they would have known. And some of them obviously did. You know, let's not forget, this, those 3,000 people that came, they were Jewish people. Okay? The, the Christian religion started with Jewish people. It didn't even go to the Gentiles for a little while after it started. Some of them did know that he was the Messiah, and they did worship him. But not all of them did. But they didn't need the New Testament to know that Jesus was coming. The Old Testament particularly the book of Isaiah, which just has crazy numbers of, of extremely accurate predictions about the Messiah, which, which were, became true in Jesus Christ. Okay. Um, if you have been severely hurt by someone and because of circumstances are no longer able to maintain any kind of relationship with them, how do you know that you have truly forgiven that person when the relationship cannot be restored? That's a good question. We walk through this sometimes, right? We have relationships that end, and when they end, it looks like they're not getting back together. Uh, they're not gonna be restored. So how do we know that we have truly forgiven that person? And a couple things I would say. One, if you're concerned about it, you've probably done it, uh, because that's where your heart is, wanting to forgive. Your desire to forgive, you're wanting to make sure you forgave, and forgiveness is something that comes in the heart, so you probably already have done it. But if you're concerned about it, forgiveness isn't just like a one-time thing, just so you know. I forgive you, and all of a sudden, magically, you forget about it, and you feel great about whatever the person did. That's not how it works. We, we forgive as, uh, forgiving is like a verb. It's like we, just, we, keep, we keep doing it. When that thing comes back, when you start to think about it again, you've got you to stay in forgiveness. And so what I would say is, if the relationship can't be restored because of nothing that you're doing, you know, in other words, you've got to keep your side of the street clean. 
As much as it depends on you, live at peace with all men, it says in the scripture. So you've got to try to restore if you can. But if the relationship is unrestorable, what you need to do is make sure that in your heart, you forgive that person. Give that to the Lord. And God doesn't play games with you. The Holy Spirit will help your heart to be forgiving. And then you, and then you maintain it. You stay in that forgiveness, always ready to restore if that's possible with the person. Oh, man, you guys are doing a lot of these questions. Um, where did the tree of good and evil come from if everything God made was good? Did God make evil? It's a great question. Next. No. It's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay? It's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Evil existed prior to that tree, not because God made it, but because Satan fell. Okay? Remember that Satan fell in his pride. He had already done evil. Evil is not a thing, though. There's not a thing that's evil. Evil is the absence of good. God made good and made it so that we would, his creatures could walk in it. When we walk away from it, it's the absence of good. We don't create, there's not like God made two things, good and evil. No, God made good. We made evil. We chose to not follow him. We chose to rebel and to do what God has not called you to do in his holiness is by itself evil. Okay, dark isn't a thing, it's the absence of light. It's not a thing called dark. There's a thing that happens when there's no light. Evil's not a thing, it's the absence of good. It's not a thing that's evil, it's when there's not good, that's the thing that's there. Okay, so you have to understand the positive, the thing God did create, the thing that God is, is good. Good and upright are you, Lord, in the song we sang today. He is good, truly and fully good and holy. When Satan fell, he was evil because he went against the good that God had done. And God had given him so much, and yet he chose to rebel against God. And each one of us has done the same, which is why we needed to be saved. But God did not create evil. He did create real people, though. You're a real person, not a robot. And because you're a real person, you had the ability to follow what God did or to not. And when you not, that's evil. He didn't create it. You did. You chose to not do what was good. He created the good. You chose to do the other thing. I chose to do the other thing. Put it all on you. It was me too. All right. There's, I, I, there's more. We could get into that more, but I want to make sure we can get as many of these as possible. Do you think we'll see the Lord's return in our lifetime? I don't know, how old are you, whoever wrote this? No, I'm okay. I hope so. I truly hope so. And yes, I do think so. Being a young man, I'm only 25 years old. I, your hair's so gray. I'm not 25. Um, I do hope to see the Lord's return. I hope to see it soon. I'm always, I'm always looking for the return of the Lord. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Um, I, I want to see God return. I hope that you do too. I believe that these signs are there to suggest that we are very close. Uh, some of the things that, it, you can just feel it a little bit, right? Like, I remember when I was younger and, and people were all about, like, the rapture and, you know, the end times and whatever. People were really excited about it. And it was like, we can point to this and we can point to this and we can point to this. And it's true, there were things that was like, oh, it looks like it's coming together. Of course, in God's timing, 50 years ago, if it happens tomorrow, 50 years ago, was well, close, you know, in God's timing. Uh, but it, right now, it's not just that I see it, I feel it. I feel it. I feel that, that something's changed. I feel that something in the world is, is, I feel that we're getting close to the time where the Holy Spirit is with, with the church is going to be taken out of the way. And the thing that the world is going towards, God's going to let it happen. God's going to let it happen. Which means that we get to get raptured if you believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. And if you don't believe in one, he doesn't ask whether you believe in it. He's just going to rapture you. So, I, you know, we have, by the way, 74 plus sessions on the end times, on the app that they've been doing for a couple years now uh, with Dr. David, with our elder Scott Robinson, Robertson and Pastor Dave Robinson have been leading this study for a couple years of 74 sessions. So they have a lot to say about that. Um, and if you want to know more about that, feel free to watch those or they're still doing it. So you can sign up and you can get on that. Okay. Uh, what scripture says children have an age of accountability? Uh, there is no scripture that says children have an age of accountability. What we have is we have the practice 
um, that we see in Judaism, and we have the practice, even, even in the common law uh, that we have, we, we have an understanding about children, the innocence of children prior to a certain age. Even Jesus says, for to you, if you don't become like one of these, you're not entering. Jesus, Jesus loved the children. Jesus was connected to children. And one of the reasons is they were prior to that age. They were in that state where they actually do. When you tell a child about God, this is important. If you have grandchildren, you have children. When you explain to a child about God, they get it at a pretty young age. He's put it in their heart. And so I actually think they, in, in many ways, are closer to the Lord and, and full trust of the Lord than we are. We actually lose trust over time because everybody else fails us. And so we wonder if God will too. But no, the, the age of accountability, and there is no, uh, that we know of, particular age, okay, where every single person, because God's made everybody different. I have a, a, a niece who is uh, 19, 20, almost 20, um, who has a disability. I don't believe she will ever reach the age of accountability. I believe that her disability, that the Lord has, our, his grace is already on her because of her disability. Um, I believe that the million children a year that are aborted, we're going to see all of them. We have a lot of babies to take care of uh, in heaven. It's going to be awesome. Um, I believe that uh, children prior to the ability to make a decision are, are not in a place where they're, where they're uh, subject to uh, the fall, the way that we are. In other words, that they would go to hell. So there is nothing in the scripture particularly that says age of accountability. But if you read the scripture as a whole, it's very clear who God holds responsible for what. And a child prior to understanding, although I do think that they can sin, I don't think that, that they can understand, prior to being able to understand God's grace and the cross and the resurrection. Remember, to be saved, you have to do what? You got to confess Jesus as Lord, believe that God has raised him from the dead. You have to be old enough to do that. God's not going to hold, we, we know the character of God. God's not going to hold somebody accountable for something that they cannot do. He'll hold you responsible for things you choose not to do. He's not going to hold you responsible for things you cannot do. Uh, that, in other words, don't have the capability. All right, we're at 11, 13. Let me see if I can grab one. Uh, if you're baptized as a baby, do you have to be baptized again? as an adult, once you make the decision to follow Christ. Uh, have to be? No. Uh, I recommend it, but I have lots of brothers and sisters who came up in Christian subcultures and denominations where pedo-baptism or baptizing infants was part of what they did. What they generally would do is they baptize the infant and then they have confirmation, which we don't do, although orientation is kind of like that for us. But confirmation where they have to actually profess Christ, they have to understand a lot of theology, and they have to do this. It usually happens in their uh, early, kind of the same time it would have happened in the Jewish religion, you know, 12, 13 years old or so. They come up, they learn the scriptures, and, the, and then they have this, uh, this time where they profess their faith. And so you have the baptism that happened that they didn't choose, and then a profession of faith, and they, that is their way of doing it. I don't that is not what I think we ought to do. But I, don't, I wouldn't get in an argument with somebody over that. So if you, my thing is your, it's about your conscience, right? Have you been obedient? If you feel like that was obedience to the scriptural command to get baptized, I'm not going to get on your case about it. I might make fun of you about it, which I do with some people. But I'm not going to get on your case about it. Uh, not being baptized being disobedient or rebellious about baptism is a problem because it's like the first command when you get saved, right? But if you think that what you've done is, is effective for that and it is baptism, it's in a Christian tradition, whatever, it's not the kind of thing we get worked up about. My grandmother grew up in the Quaker church where they, most Quaker churches don't do baptism at all. And all Quakers aren't going to hell because they didn't get baptized. My grandmother, that's the that tradition they grew up in. They have reasons for why they don't do it. She ain't going to do it. She loves the Lord Jesus. She's definitely saved. If anyone's saved, Grandma Field is saved, okay? She is super, a wonderful woman of God. Just turned 90. We had her birthday yesterday. It was, it was amazing, yeah. My other grandma is awesome, too. She's 91, and uh, she loves the Lord, too. So, uh, and I will tell you, let me just tell you something. I'm going to take a minute and tell you this. I reflected on this this week because my dad and I went down, as, as many of you know, that's why I wasn't here on Sunday, uh, because my grandfather, his father, died. I went down and spent some time, and I reflected on how the legacy 
that I have had because my grandmother and my grandfather, my dad's parents, and my grandmother and my grandfather, my mom's parents, all loved the Lord, dedicated to the Lord, dedicated to the Lord. Yes, you can clap for them. They, they were faithful for many years. And so my mom and my dad were dedicated to the Lord and were faithful for many years. And although I myself was a hot mess disaster as a young man, the Lord brought me back. And the, the legacy that they left is something amazing. So do not, do not uh, undervalue the legacy that you are building as a Christ follower, whether you're a grandma, a grandpa, a mom, a dad, an aunt, a friend, a sister, or whatever, your legacy has such an effect. I mean, is it even thinkable that I would be able to serve the Lord as I do without all of them, without my parents, without their parents? No. That legacy is so important. And so do that for your children. I'm going to do one more. It's 1117. Um, that will take too long. Um, I'll try to do this quick. What does God say about, what does the Bible say about the morality of slavery, i.e. owning slaves versus voluntarily giving every part of your life to Christ like a slave? So they're separating those two. What does it say about owning slaves? And what can you say to critics of the Bible who use that as evidence that the Bible cannot be moral because it condones slavery? Um, okay. Uh, so here's, here's how this works. First of all, and, and this is, you have to understand a couple things. What you understand is slavery. In other words, what was happening in the 18th and 19th centuries in the United States is not historically what slavery was. Okay? It was its, its sui generis. It was its own thing. The idea of kidnapping West African people, bringing them to the United States and selling them as property, that was not a thing. In fact, the Bible specifically says that you get the death penalty for doing that. If you kidnap a man or a woman and take them as a slave, they, you get killed. That was the, that was, it was a death penalty offense to do that. So the idea of slavery as a racial thing, that didn't exist in the, in the Bible times. And neither in the Old Testament times nor in the Roman times was race a factor in slavery. It wasn't like, oh, these people are a different kind of people, so they should be slaves. And these people, that is an entirely Western, vile, evil, ugly thing that happened that dishonored millions of people dishonored their, their image and likeness of God, the fact that they are image bearers of God. That's, so that slavery that you are familiar with from, from the one that we fought the Civil War over, okay? That slavery is totally different than what we're talking about. So I want to make sure we're separating the two things so you understand in context what was happening. The other thing that I already told you earlier is that it wasn't like it is now where basically everybody is able to pay for the things that they need. You would, in fact, the Bible gives the ability for a, for a Jewish person to sell themselves to another Jewish person as a slave, okay? And even to sell themselves to a Gentile who was living in the land as a slave. Now, there were rules about that and how it worked, but they were allowed to do that. Why? Because they didn't have anything to eat, and they were willing to work to have something to eat. You look at, you look at the story uh, of Jacob. You know, he goes to Laban, seven years you know, sells his labor for seven years. Then he gets tricked and has to sell his labor for another seven years because Laban was not a biblical slave uh, person. Um, and so he had to deal with that. But that was a normal part of things. But I don't even think that God thinks that that is good, okay? I don't even think he thinks that is good. I think that slavery existed. First of all, the Hebrews did not invent slavery. Christians certainly did not invent slavery. In fact, Christians are the reason there's not slavery now. It was Christians who came in and said, this is wrong, we must not do that. There is no other basis to base that on, right? You gotta understand that non-Christian views of the world don't have a basis to say slavery is wrong. It was Christians who did that. Christians who did that, okay? But at the time, you have to understand that it was a completely different economic system. You could become a slave because you needed money. Maybe you had a debt, whatever it was, and I'd come out and say, I'll sell you my labor for, and, and the Jews would have been let go after six years. And in, in the year, in the seventh year, they'd be freed. If you were a slave for longer than that, or you were, all slaves had to be let go in the year of Jubilee every 50 years. Okay, so it was a different system. But you could go and you could sell yourself, you could sell your labor to somebody. It was never sex slavery. It was never race-based slavery. And you had to treat your slave well. Now, having said all of that, 
I think God allowed it because of the hardness of their hearts. Just like he allowed you to, a man to divorce his wife by giving her a certificate of divorce. And they come to Jesus and they say, hey, Moses said we could do that. He says, yeah, because you, you have hard hearts. Because it was the least that I, that I was able to get you to do in the law because you were so, you so much wanted to be like the people around. And so slavery existed as a practice within the world. And I think that God did not upend it because of the hardness of their hearts back then. And then when we're Christians, the way that we get rid of slavery is because God got into our hearts and told us that we are all equal and we are all image bearers. And, and the scripture is clear about it. There is neither male nor female, slave nor free, right? That you, is, he, he made no distinction. So when you had a slave, which is again, not like what we saw in the 17th, 18th, 19th century. When you had a slave, the scripture was very clear. That person that's working for you is just as valuable as you. You both have the same master and that's God. So the process is one of understanding equality. That's a Christian principle. And that's what eventually got rid of the slave trade, particularly the evil, vile slave trade of the 18th and 19th century in the United States, which is a, which is a pockmark and cost the blood of hundreds of thousands of Americans who fought over it because it was so ugly and vile. So, not a great one to end it on, but um, I think that's an important thing for us to understand about the scripture and slavery. Okay.